From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Ah, thanks very much, Natalie Powell. Thank you indeed. How you doing, by the way? It's uh, Thursday, May 23rd, 2019. Hope you've had a good day wherever you happen to be in the world. Thanks for joining the Richie Allen Show. You can tweet the programme from now, as always, right up until the end of it. The Twitter handle hasn't changed. It's at Richie Allen Show. That's at Richie Allen Show. Richie Allen. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, somebody said to me yesterday, you sounded a bit manic there yesterday afternoon, Richie. Of course I sounded a bit manic. It's like driving a new car. You know every now and then when you change your car, you're a bit nervous driving the car, you know? When my old Ford Focus estate was written off last year, and then I got a Renault Megane estate. <laughs> Took me a while to get used to the Megane, and it's taken me a while to get used to this studio, but I'm much better today. Gilad Atzman, the legendary jazz saxophonist, joins the program. And of course, he's a political researcher, he's an author. Being in time, a post-political manifesto, his most recent book, is a fantastic read on all things identity politics. And it's wonderfully, it's wonderfully prescient, that book, and relevant with respect to what's going on in this country and around Europe right now. So Gilad Atman joins the programme. He publishes articles on his website, gilad.co.uk, and there's a terrific article on his uh, site posted yesterday about the rise of Nigel Farage and the demise of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, it's a bit more than that, right? I'm obviously, well, I'm maybe not doing it justice. It's a fascinating article about utopia, about the politics of the past, about linear narratives, about timelines. Brilliant stuff. I tweeted a link out to it today, and we'll get into that with Gilad Atzman a little bit later on this hour. Yeah. By the way, it is the birthday today of the one and only Horror Indoors, the other half, the better half. Use your own cliche. Uh, Caroline, uh, my longtime partner, life partner and soulmate, turned 41 today. The good thing about being 40, when you're depressed about being 40, it's going to come around soon enough that you're 41. No going backwards. So, um, yeah, the brilliant, wonderful uh, future Mrs. Allen, 41 today. Happy birthday, our kid. So once you heard Natalie Powell say, not that you needed to be told anyway, they've gone to the polls today in the Netherlands and in the UK to put MEPs back to Brussels. So it's not depressing in terms of the Netherlands, the Netherlands hasn't left the European Union. It's tried to. It's rejected EU treaties before, just like Ireland, and was told to go back and think again. But uh, it hasn't left the European Union. We haven't either, but we voted to leave. So it's very depressing, but all too predictable, sadly. And I want to... Somebody said to me, you're a great fella, Richie, for making claims about things that you that you said in the past. And you're a great fella for claiming that you predicted stuff in the past. Listen, I'm more likely to tell you about my failures, about my crystal ball failures, of which there have been thousands compared to my count on one hand successes. But yeah, if you go to iTunes or Spotify or Podomatic and listen to the shows before and just after the 2016 referendum, you'll know that I have pretty much called it the way that it's gone. Did you vote today, Richie? Did you vote today, Richie? Did you? I didn't, of course I didn't vote today. It would have been difficult today anyway because I've moved houses, you know. It's quite a trek back to my previous neighbourhood. But to be honest, I haven't voted in a general or local election, let alone voting for MEPs since 2002 in Ireland. Last time I voted was in 2002 in the Irish general election. I voted Sinn Féin and I voted the Socialist Workers' Party. 
That's who I voted. How did you do that now, Richie? Because we have proportional representation in Ireland. Look it up if you don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. So I wouldn't have voted. No, I did vote in the June 2016 referendum. Are you a hypocrite, Richie? No, I'm not a hypocrite. I voted in the 2016 referendum, as I made clear at the time. The polling station was only a half a kilometre away in St. Kentigern's Primary School in South Manchester on Wilbraham Road. I'm laughing because I never heard of any St. Kentigern when I was in primary school in St. Saviour's National School in Ballybeg in Waterford City. Who the hell is St. Kentigern? Who is St. Kentigern? I have no idea. But I voted uh, three years ago. I took a picture of my ballot, which apparently was illegal, but I did it anyway. And said, look, I voted, and I voted to leave. But I've spent entire programmes explaining to people why I don't vote for candidates or parties, because they all serve the same masters. Don't start, Richie. I'm not going to start. I'm not. I've told you too many times before. There is no road to Eden through the ballot box. So mad times. Mad times. Three years after people voted to leave, not only has the UK not left, but we're sending MEPs back to Brussels. It's positively Pythonesque, I tell you. Tis so farcical. More on that in a minute. And on. A few minutes' time, we might have a bit more of that. Um, some weather we're having, eh? It's been a very warm and dry spring. Must be global warming or climate change or whatever else they're calling it. It isn't, of course, but they don't miss any opportunity to talk about it. I heard some local radio this morning talking about how wonderful May has been and what a beautiful start to spring we've had. Sure, it must be climate change. Well, it isn't, but never let the truth get in the way of a good lie. Quick bit of housekeeping. I've had a few emails and tweets from people saying, Richie, what about 5G and other such issues? Yes, I will be returning to those subjects in radio shows real soon. So give me, give me a chance. Back on air uh, next week. I will have Sunday View on Sunday and I'll be back with you, of course, next week for the regular two-hour show with guests. Some very funny stuff in the press today, by the way, amid all the doom and gloom. Some funny stuff. Stuff that made me laugh. And I think if it makes me laugh, well, maybe somebody else will laugh. Uh, this was in the mail. The mail, that's the daily mail for my overseas listeners. And it was in some other newspapers as well. Women are less likely than men to receive life-saving CPR in a public place if they suffer a cardiac arrest. This is true. Dutch scientists found 73% of men who had public cardiac arrests received CPR from a bystander, but only 68% of women did. Do I have to explain what CPR is? Do I? Do I? I'm sure you know. Do I have to tell you? I'm embarrassed because I don't know. I never did a first aid course. Well, it's where you compress the chest area. It's where you give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. If you're lucky and there's a defibrillator in the vicinity, you can smash the glass and get the defibrillator. CPR. So they're saying that if you're a man and you have a heart attack in public, you're more likely to survive it because you'll get CPR from a bystander. But less likely if you're a woman. And what is the reason why? Well... Dutch scientists said that fears that touching a woman's chest might be seen as sexual harassment may put people off from helping to restart their heart. What kind of fuckery is this? Yeah, yeah, one of, one of the Me Too legacies, apparently. <laughs> this is true. And the British Heart Foundation have commented on this today and said, yes, women were 7% less likely to get CPR from a member of the public. And, says the British Heart Foundation, that's a worrying thing. You think? That's your me too for you there. Chucking milkshakes at those you disagree with politically is all the rage, as you know. Farage, Tommy the Tit. And today, an old gentleman who is campaigning for the Brexit Party. Now, the man's name is Don McNaughton, who's in his 80s, and he spent 22 years in the army. And he was covered in milkshake today. He was campaigning for the Brexit party outside a polling station in Aldershot. Uh, pretty shocking this. Somebody came up to him, a 22-year-old guy, or a guy in his mid-20s, I should say. 
You get it right, Richie. He was in the army for 22 years, yes. And a guy in his mid-twenties came up and chucked a milkshake at him. No, I'm not being a hypocrite. You never heard me agree with the milkshaking of Tommy Robinson or anybody else. I don't agree with that, irrespective of what you might think about somebody's political opinions. So don't call me a hypocrite. I'm not. Um, this is a shocking thing. This chap is in his 80s. Well presented man. And he's doing his thing outside the polling station saying, why don't you vote for the Brexit party? And some yob came up to him and chucked a milkshake over him, gave him the finger, told him to go and F himself and ran away. Guy in his mid-twenties pouring a milkshake over the head of a man in his mid-eighties. Tough guy. Tough guy, eh? Tough guy. But even more bizarrely, dear listener, I found this today. I found this incredible. Stands have been erected offering free milkshakes outside polling stations in Kent, where Farage is standing. You see, Farage is standing for the South East England constituency, where he's been an MP for a couple of decades, MEP for a couple of decades. So they've actually erected stands offering free milkshakes, if you want to get one and chuck it at Farage or somebody else you don't like. This is a drinks company called Plenish, and they make a plant-based dairy-free milkshake. They said they've come up with the idea after the Brexit party leader was hit by a milkshake earlier this week. Hopefully, their target audience will conclude that plenish milk th milkshakes are shit. They're so shit, they're only fit for throwing away in the first place. So it might backfire on them, so to speak. I did notice a couple of the UK-based uh, television news programmes today were holding debates with people debating whether or not it should be criminal to throw something at somebody. I, I, the mind boggles. Of course it should be criminal. A guy in his mid-twenties running up to a man or a woman, throwing a milkshake at him, destroying his shirt, hitting him. That's an assault, that. Doesn't matter what they stand for. It's an assault. And it's an outrage that people are going on television saying, oh, it's, it's theatre, it's all good fun. It's an assault. Uh, there was a story about a boy in Malaysia getting his penis stuck in a toilet plumbing pipe. <laughs> let's, let's not do that. It's not suitable for our audience. Interesting story, though. So Theresa May, then. Theresa May, the Prime Minister in all but name. The Prime Minister in name. You know, she's the Prime Minister in name, but she won't be around for very long. Will not be putting her withdrawal bill out there for debate until early June. She had said that her new amended withdrawal bill would be published for people to see on Friday. But we're now not going to get a look at it and it won't be debated until early June. If you're listening to or following UK media, you will know that her time is up. It's only a matter of days, maybe a couple of weeks. She's finished. Um, pledges that she made in this new deal have um, basically done for her and diminished or totally destroyed what little support she had left in her own party. Namely, she said that if MPs voted for her withdrawal bill, they could then vote on whether or not to hold a second referendum on the European Union. So Andrea Ledson, the Commons leader, has quit. She was the latest in a number of High-profile people, I suppose, who quit and uh, has left May kind of high and dry. Let's have a quick listen, just a quick listen before we move on to Sky News' John Craig, who's been following this closely. Well, she said at Prime Minister's questions yesterday that she would be uh, with President Trump at the ceremony at Portsmouth for the D-Day uh, anniversary. Um, it will be setting out a timetable rather than an abrupt resignation uh, because, of course, there's quite a long process to come for electing her successor. Now, originally, she had planned to meet Sir Graham Brady after the second reading debate on the withdrawal agreement bill which was planned for the first week of June. Well, that's been postponed now, inevitably, really, given the uh, fury with which it was greeted by uh, Tory backbenchers appalled at her concession uh, of a second referendum vote and uh, a customs union. Uh, and so... Um, 
Um, the, the, the timetable probably will involve uh, some sort of departure at some point in June and of course the long uh, elect process, the process of the electing uh, uh, the Tory successor. The problem of course is, well not a problem, but the fact is um, there's a lot of candidates, a very crowded field, could be uh, uh, up to 20 candidates. That was the Prime Minister looking uh, rather tearful in the back of her car, so it was claimed, bleary-eyed. Uh, today, however, she's moved pretty swiftly to replace Andrea Leadsom. Uh, Andrea Leadsom's successor as leader of the House of Commons is Mel Stride. Uh, he's a Devon MP and he was a Treasury Minister. Uh, good Commons performer, often wheeled out to uh, defend difficult uh, economic stories by the Chancellor uh, uh, Philip Hammond. The other interesting thing about uh, Mel Stride is that uh, he's Michael Gove's campaign manager. Yeah, that must be a lovely job being Penfold's campaign manager, Michael Gove. So it's chaos, it's turmoil, and it's uncertainty. Now, Gilad Atzman, who, despite being a brilliant musician, is also a really, really, really deep thinker. I think he's a bit of a philosopher. He's um, got a brilliant book out. It's been out for over a year now called Being in Time, a Post-Political Manifesto, where he talks about identity politics broadly, and fleshes it out to encompass these issues, the ones we're talking about uh, today. And it's a brilliant book and I can't recommend it highly enough. I've read it three times now. I really have. And I've liberally quoted from it without giving Gilad any credit. No, I have. I always give credit where credit is due. So we're going through a lot of chaos and turmoil and uncertainty. And I was thinking about this today and I was thinking about you, dear listener. How do I say something that I've said a million times before, but how do I say it a bit differently? Here goes. I think chaos, turmoil and uncertainty would be if the ruling elite had a toolbox. There would be plenty of tools in it, but chaos, turmoil and uncertainty as tools, and they're all the same thing, are tools that are favoured by the ruling elite, by the establishment. And I've noticed, particularly over the last few days, and you might laugh at this, but in the course of moving house and moving the studio, I've gotten to speak to more people than I would have done for months beforehand because I've been out and about more, obviously, shopping and doing stuff and moving and working with people, helping me to make the move. And I've been chatting to them about everything and anything. Most of them never had any idea about this program or, or, or me, and I didn't tell them about this program or me either, but I asked them questions about you know, the Brexit process and the European Union, just to see what they were saying to me, taxi drivers and all the rest of it. So I think this lunacy that we're in the middle of is definitely having a psychological effect on the populace. I do. I think people are uneasy. I think they're worried. I think they're concerned. And I think they're uncertain. And it probably manifests itself in different ways for different people. But I've really noticed this since I've been out and about and speaking with people in the last... You know, it's not as if I was closed away in a tower prior to that, but it was a sheltered existence. I think people are subconsciously disturbed, if there is such a thing, if you can be subconsciously disturbed. And I think they're disturbed by the rise in anger, because the anger is palpable. The tension is palpable. You know, we've seen sporadic outbreaks of violence at various rallies, not just rallies posted by or hosted by people on the far right, but other rallies as well. I think that worries people. I think people worry when they see people turning to polarising figures to lead them through this pretty rotten time. That worries people. When they see people following people that are violent and thuggish, and criminal in their behaviour, or at least in their previous behaviour. I really do believe that. And of course, the people who follow these polarising figures have no idea that these figures are provided by the establishment. We know it. You know it and I know it. And I'm not talking about polarising figures and hardliners on the right. I'm talking about their counterparts on the left as well. Provided by the establishment, on the right and on the left. And in the maelstrom, there's a good word now, in the maelstrom, there's great opportunity to transform society by offering people 
the way out, or at least the appearance of the way out. So this unease and uncertainty and real worry and almost like a feeling of displacement created by the establishment deliberately is to transform society. And one of the ways you do it is you tell people that you will protect them from the threats that you created. Now by threats, I don't mean that the puppets on the far right or on the left are genuine threats. They're not. But to ordinary men and women, they perceive them as threats. They're nervous. They're scared. So the elite says, or the hidden hand, or the system, or the establishment, we have so many names for it, says, well, I tell you what, we've got an answer to that. David Icke would have said problem, reaction, solution. The answer is, we'll protect you from these threats through censorship and through surveillance. And when people are scared, they'll accept it. You've only got to see any number of Vox Pops conducted by the UK media where they ask people, you know, do you think it's okay if we give the government more control over social media and we give we give the government the powers to shut things down? You'll find in the Vox Pops, and maybe, of course, the Vox Pops are selectively edited to make it sound like people agree to it. But generally, when you watch the Vox Pops, people say, oh, yeah, it's a good thing. Hate speech is dangerous and, and people are dangerous and people shouldn't have to read that stuff, so it's okay. And it's, it's, These are scary times, so it's okay. So when folks are scared, they'll accept it. And I was thinking again today, don't do too much thinking, Richie, you might say. It doesn't suit you. But a great example of this is the BBC and Sky News obsession with knife crime. Have you been following this? You have done. I've not talked very much about knife crime in the UK, except when I've had Peter Kirkham, the former Met detective, on. But there's an, there's an obsession with the UK media about knife crime. It never ends. Never ends. No exaggeration here. You've got special report after special report, and followed by interviews with former gang members talking about what needs to be done, schools and all the rest of it. And Sky News is running another special report today claiming bizarrely that kids are playing an online game where they score points on a virtual scoreboard. Listen up because I'm not making this up. If you're listening to this overseas, you might not believe this. The kids are using a virtual scoreboard where they get points for stabbing people and the body is divided up into various targets. The leg, the arm or whatever. I mean, this is terrifying stuff to Middle England, right? Middle England. Lower England. Upper England. It's terrifying to people watching this stuff. Claiming that there's an online scoreboard game going on. And then they talk about county lines, drug running, youngsters getting into gangs, wanting to be gangsters. So the networks are terrifying people to the point where, where people like you and me actually think there's a chance you might get knifed. I mean, this is mad stuff, Ted. This is proper mad, Ted. Because there's more chance of you getting killed by a flying piano, not a falling piano, a flying piano, than of actually getting knifed by a teenage drug courier or a wannabe gangster. Now that's statistically, I've not done any statistic calculations on that, but I'm going to bet you that a jumbo jet falling out of the sky and hitting you on the head is more likely than you getting stabbed by a young drug courier or a wannabe gangster. But the coverage is relentless. It's relentless. I've never, in recent times, I've seen this before going back years, but I've never seen it as concentrated as it is now. It's relentless. Honest to God, I'm going to say it again. It's relentless coverage for months now about knife crime. And the solutions are, of course, give the police power to shut down video channels on YouTube. Give the police the power to order the removal of social media accounts so these kids can't brag about the stabbings. And do you think they'll reserve the deletion of accounts just for knife crime? Do you think so? Think again. Transforming society through playing on people's fears and their insecurities. There's no common sense among people. Well, we're hearing a lot about knife crime. Do you know anybody who was stabbed by a young teenage drug courier? No, neither do I. And I might have listeners now who are 
maybe living in and around inner city areas. And I might have listeners who might be um, black or they might be an ethnic minority and they might say, oh, that's your white privilege, Richie. You can stick that up your arse, white privilege. It's got nothing to do with white privilege. It's the same for black and Asian people. You're more likely to be killed by a plane falling on your head than by a knife. But it's never off the telly. And another issue being relentlessly promoted by the mass media is mental health. Again, it never ends. Never ends. Always on the news. I hear it every day. Footballers. Danny Rose. Brilliant fullback. Plays for Spurs. Danny Rose. I'm depressed. Celebrities telling you it's normal to be depressed and that you should seek help. William and Harry. William and Harry. God love him. Meeting with people publicly saying that they've had to deal with depression over their mother's death. Except that bereavement is a normal human emotion that you can't treat. They want to medicate this stuff now. William was a, an air ambulance pilot. Privileged job for a future king. And he said he had to deal with feelings of depression and despair after attending accidents in his ambulance where children, younger people were involved. Yeah. Yeah, that's a normal human emotion. Regret, dismay, sadness, sorrow. Jesus Christ, he was only 12. God love him. It's not depression. You don't need to treat that stuff. It's normal. Clips are flying around the UK news organisations of William and Harry speaking with sportsmen and women who said that they had mental health issues in competition. Turns out they had anxiety. Fuck me, eh? You're on telly, competing internationally, and you're anxious. Good. You're, you're a human being. I get anxious every now and then when I do a live radio show. Not so much anymore. It's normal. Ex-footballers. I went into depression after retiring. Of course you did. You were playing to tens of thousands of people a week. Adoring fans. Then it stops. Come on, man. And they sit there on television and talk about this stuff. If it's not knife crime, it's about depression and mental health issues that we've all got to acknowledge that we have. Everybody's got to come forward and acknowledge that you've got mental health issues. They're not asking people, have you got a mental health issue? They're telling you, you've got a mental health issue. You must have. You must have. And they talk about it. And on television, they're enabled to do that by some fucking psychologist, which is not a science anyway, psychology, who says suffering mental health crises is perfectly normal. But it's not a mental health crisis. It's a human nature. It's human nature. It's human nature to be fed up when you get up in the morning. It's human nature to be fed up when you get out of bed at half five and it's dark and it's pissing down outside and you hate the job you have. Because of how unfair it is. Because the pay is crap. you got to drive 90 minutes to get there. That's not a mental health crisis. That's normality. That's your inner being saying, this is fucking crazy. But you know the worst of all this, and I know that my UK listeners are sitting there now going, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Knife crime, mental health, never off the news agenda. Do you know what the worst of it is? The worst of it is, their real target audience is children because they want to have children being able to access mental health care in schools because often they finish these programs by saying well let's let's make sure that the generations coming don't have to put up with what we have to put up what do we have to put up with we were a bit depressed sometimes a bit fed up sometimes a bit down in yourself sometimes you had a bereavement you had a breakup depression I was depressed no you weren't your girlfriend broke up with you. You didn't want the relationship to end. That's terrible. You're sad. That's a normal human emotion. They want to medicate that. Now they want children having access to mental health in schools where they can first of all debrief the kids and find out personal details about the children's private lives. Wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. But then ultimately medicate them. Medicate them. Medicate and 27 minutes to the top of the hour. That's that's not a gross exaggeration. All of this uncertainty, this disturbance, 
this worry, this concern, this kind of feeling that the roof was caving in with all the chaos. That's a deliberate creation of the cabal. And the cabal has got the solution. I was going to do something about Emily Maitlis, who interviewed a guy called Lord Sachs on Newsnight last night. I won't, because I want to get straight into Gilad Atzman. So I'll do, maybe do that a bit later on. Not on for the full two hours today. You know this if you were listening to me yesterday. Um, easing my way back in. Great to be back with you. The Richie Allen Show, live right now on Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv, Tune In Radio, and of course, RichieAllen.co.uk. Did I mention happy birthday to the future Mrs. Allen? Did I? I think I might have said happy birthday to her. This is Altered Images. Back with the wonderful Gilad Atzman after this. Yeah, Claire Grogan, Altered Images. Happy birthday on the Richie Allen Show. It's 24 minutes to the top of the hour. Lovely jubbly. Right, uh, just a couple of quick comments before we welcome Gilad back to the programme. Samantha says, Richie, my daughter's school kept telling me she had mental health issues and that I should take her to the doctor. She was having a few down days because she's a teenager and has her monthly. Well, I said as politely as possible, do fuck off, won't you, says Samantha. And I've been following with great interest, you know, even through the move, this standoff between schools in Birmingham and elsewhere where Muslim parents, I shouldn't say Muslim parents, I should say Asian parents, they're not all Muslims, predominantly Muslims, are saying, look, we don't want you talking to our five and six-year-old children about sexuality and about issues around LGBTQ plus whatever. We'd rather we did that ourselves. And that's very interesting, that. And it all segues into the agenda for schools in the future and how scary that is for anybody who has an idea of what's going on in the world and why how scary it is for them, the thoughts of leaving their children with a school for the best part of the year, every year. Anyway, my next guest is no stranger. My only guest today is no stranger uh, to you. He's a, a brilliantly successful musician, but he's also a philosopher, I would have said, a political commentator and an author whose uh, most recent book, Being in Time, a post-political manifesto is really important. I think it's one of the more important books in the last couple of years in explaining how we've come to the point that we've reached now, how we've come to feel as we do about our world and about politics. It's really, really interesting. Uh, check it out. Go to gillad.co.uk. It's available at all good online retailers as well. Now, this week, he's posted on his website. He regularly blogs there. Why Farage wins the country and Corbyn wins only a party. And he has juxtaposed the career paths, or at least the recent fortunes, of the former UKIP leader, the current leader of the Brexit party, Nigel Farage. He's compared and contrasted what Farage has achieved with what Jeremy Corbyn has not achieved, or at least, you know, comparing that Jeremy Corbyn has seemingly stagnated and has wasted the political capital that he maybe once enjoyed, the huge popularity he enjoyed. He talks a lot about right-wing thinking and left-wing uh, thinking in the article, talking about a linear timeline and how, well, I tell you what, th there's so many questions I want to ask. Rather than I explain it to you, let's welcome back to the programme our old friend Gilad Atzman. Gilad, welcome back. Hello, Richie. I'm so happy to be with you. It's brilliant to have you on, uh, and it's a really brilliant article. It's short and sweet and punchy and dynamic. And it, it takes some time, you know, uh, to, 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 to condense my uh, ideas into a um, short statement. For me, if you can say something in one sentence, what some people call aphorism, this is the ultimate uh, achievement. And, and I've been working on it for a while. <laughs> has, has somebody had a word with you? Because it is brilliantly edited. It almost looks edited. Or have you edited? I, do, I don't want to get into this semantics, but I've been told before about, um, you know, saying things in four sentences rather than 24 and all the rest of it. But no, it's very easy to read and it hits the uh, nail on the head, I think. There are a yeah, few things I want to get into. Go ahead. The principle is very, very simple. We do notice that... Um, 
whenever, and it's not just uh, today in this election, whenever the condition, the social, the economic, uh, economical condition uh, are uh, pretty much mature for a socialist or a left revolution, it is always the right wing who deliver this revolution, they steal this revolution, and they are doing it brilliantly. And uh, I think that in being in time, I came very close to explain it. And it took me 200 pages. And I believe that I can say it now in just a few sentences. It is very clear, it was very clear to me when I wrote Being and Time, that left is somehow delusional uh, to the point that it is even, and I'm sorry if, it, if some leftists find it offensive, detached from the human nature and the human spirit. And why this happens? Because the left argument is always phrased as ought to be. We ought to live in equality. We ought to live to respect each other. We ought to live in tolerance. Now, I'm not against any of those issues. I'm just explaining the metaphysics here. This is the core of the utopian nature of the left argument. So the left message is always something that is going to take place in the future. So the left timeline is a very simple um, um, a chronological approach from the past to the future without living through the present. What is so interesting in the right-wing argument, now I'm talking about left and right, despite the fact we are, that we are living in a post-political condition, just to make it very simple. In the right-wing argument, very often, we change the arrow of time. So, for instance, when Donald Trump comes to the American people and he tells them, I want to make, we are, we are going to make America great again, he actually locates the past in the future. And why he did it, and by the way, it wasn't the first one, Reagan did it before, and Hitler did it before both of them. Um, Hitler promised to make Germany great again. Uh, exactly at the time uh, the Germans were uh, ready for, uh, for a communist revolution. Presupposing the notion that things were once great, this is why your article is hugely important. Let me yes. just intervene, and I won't be doing too much interrupting you now, but right. they talk about making America great again. This is a brilliant juxtaposition you've made between the left and the right. We will yes. get back to where we once were. The truth is, though, it can be argued, we were never there. This is this is a very strong point, and we will touch it in a second. Yeah, but the reason that the the message of Trump is so popular among among working class, the reason that Hitler became so popular amongst the working class, despite the fact that you know the communists and the socialists presented him as the enemy, and they actually joined him after he, he came to power, is because. And this is an observation that I made in Being in Time. For working class, utopia, that thing that the left is trying to sell to the working class all the time, utopia is actually nostalgia. Now, I will definitely address your point because it is a very important issue. What we really see that rather than looking at the banal progression of time from past to present to future, we actually in the eyes of the right-wing ideologist, can move actually from the future to the past, or from the present to the past to the future, or from the present to the future to the past, we can do whatever we like. Now, why this message is so strong? Because in the current dystopia in America, where people, when we see manufacturing evaporating, actually the past look way more solid because at a certain point in the past, people can remember that uh, a milkman could feed the family of uh, five uh, people and the wife could even stay at home and, uh, and take care of education and so on and so on. 
the Brits also have memories, uh, very similar memories. The Brits remember that even 25 years ago, uh, you could still buy uh, a roof, you know, and may, 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 look, uh, set yourself into mortgage and, and buy a home, yes. something that is pr pr pretty much... Uh, uh, impossible uh, for uh, most uh, breeds for our kids and so on and so on. So there is something in the past that we like, that we like and we cherish and we are longing for. Now, why the right message is so appealing? Because it reflects something that is essential to the human experience. What do I try to say here? People, in their vision of temporality, of the future, of the past, of the present, tend to move arbitrarily between the different time zones. So, for instance, when we, I'll, I'll give you an example that is close to my heart, when we look at the brutality of a Jewish pressure group uh, in the last two, three years, for, in, for instance, the, the, the campaign that they run against Corbyn, against uh, musicians, against myself, against, your, uh, against yourself, against David Icke, and so on and so on. Some people may say, you know what, maybe we should look again at the history of the Jewish people, because if this is how they behaved in the past, this could be this could explain why their history is so troubling. People have the tendency to look at the past, at the human experience in an essentialist manner, to look for a principle that drive life, that drive spirituality, that drive culture, and so on and so on. They like to see a continuum between the present and the future. This is exactly the element in the human experience that is explored not just by uh, Farage, it is also explored by uh, Tommy Re Robinson, who is, as far as I understand, is quite popular in your region at the moment. Now, I'm not taking, I'm not kind of uh, telling people here to vote to Farage or to Tommy Robinson. I'm not taking a political position at all. I'm just analyzing the, the, the metaphysics of the political message. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's really good and it's a brilliant, it's a powerful argument. Gilad Asman is our guest, gilad.co.uk. I tweeted the article uh, today, it's on there. This is powerful stuff, this. This is real thinking and it's important that we get into these issues. Look, I think you're bang on the money, but I want to make the point about it never being so good. You said, yes, it was less bad. And look, I can understand that coming from a council estate in Waterford City in Ireland. I know that it was less bad. But I would argue that the dystopia that you described today was 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 on the march or was in the pipeline, except that people couldn't see it then because, as you said, it wasn't as bad as it is now. Not because we had better politicians or a more civil discourse than we do now. We didn't. I think it's because people were oblivious. They had jobs, as you said. You mentioned the milkman, Gilad. Cost yeah. of living wasn't too bad. They got boy. So I would argue the noose was always around people's necks, but not as tight as it is but, now. And I would also argue... I obviously, I obviously agree with you. I yeah. obviously agree with you. And it is quite obvious that when uh, in the past, the left was way more relevant and by the way way more functional and i can easily explain it we grew up i think that you are younger than me but um, um we grew up in a world that was driven by manufacturing accordingly a politician would come to your city in Ireland or to my city in uh, in uh, Tel Aviv and he, he will tell us you know if you Give me the power. Trust me, I will bring more work. Yeah. Politicians don't do that anymore because we, the people, have been reduced into consumers. And the role of the politicians 
is basically to sustain consumption by means of credit. Now, what has been happening, and this is something that what we see today is comp it's classic case, uh, people have been witnessing a total betrayal of the political system, globalization. Manufacturing was thrown out of the window. Else NHS is collapsing. Education, just before we started the interview, you spoke about this absurdity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, education and uh, gender education in schools. Yeah. We, we, I don't even want to go into it. It's very clear to everyone. And the big question is how is it possible that all these huge transitions happen to us without the BBC exploring it, without the media in general exploring it, without the, politi the political class uh, standing up against it, and uh, without academia, you know, professors are getting a lot of money to produce research, social scientists, and to tell us what is going on. How is it possible that it is me, a saxophonist, this is not my job. My job is to play fast and loud. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense that it, was, it would be me who's, who, who was the first one to produce the criticism of this, uh, of this uh, shift. Now, the reason that all those things happened and we were not allowed to talk about them is because we were first hijacked by identitarian philosophies, philosophies that taught us to speak as a, as a woman, as a gay, as a Jew, as a Muslim. And slightly more concerning is the fact that political correctness, or I would say tyranny correctness, became the, the, the medium in which we were operating. So practically speaking, we were not allowed to discuss all those things that bothers us. And uh, what we see in the election today, or in the last six weeks, there is a huge amount of anger that was suppressed in Britain, but we see the same thing in America, in France, and it is now coming out. And the meaning of it is that the Tory party, the Labour party, who has been treacherous now for decades, are obliterated. And I must say that it is a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, both. There's a, there's a number of both there. I, I, okay. want to, I, want, I want to read a paragraph from your article. Gillard writes, left ideology is structured around an ever-progressing timeline. The left always promises to make things better in the future, to fight austerity, to care for the many, not the few, to bring about equality and tolerance, etc. None of this is happening at present. This leaves the left as a promise that is supposed to fulfil itself in an imaginary tomorrow. Now, every word of that I agree with, I endorse, except the left is not the left, as you and I would have understood. Right. The, the left is, is, is social democrats. Jeremy Corbyn isn't and never was a socialist. I think socialism, I'm a history graduate. I, my biggest heroes in history are people like Salvador Allende, of course, and uh, Bolivar, of course, and Hugo Chavez, real socialists. And those, okay. those leftists didn't live in the future. Well, we, we promise you this. You, it's a brilliant article. It's one of the best things I've read in years, to be honest. It's a brilliant piece. These guys that live in the future, this utopian society we can build with equality for everybody and no gender identity and all this fucking bullshit, excuse my language. This is the imagination of social democrats. Socialists don't exist anymore, at least not in public life, because socialists were men and women of action in the present. Go ahead. Okay. I uh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, you're right. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, this article is short, because uh, it is not 
as accurate as it should be, because if I would like to make it accurate and to define exactly what is the left that I'm referring to, this will take uh, make it from one page into five pages. Into a book. You could do a book on <laughs> into it. Into a book. And I've, wrote, and I've written the book already. It is published. It's called Being in Time. I try to deliver a very simple message and to reach as many people as I can. Now, the, you are absolutely right. I am one of those people who are extremely uh, disappointed with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And mind you, I still think that Jeremy Corbyn is the best thing in the Labour Party, which means that this party is rotten to the core. And you are right. They are not leftists. They are what we call identitarians. And what is the biggest difference between leftists and identitarians? While the left was a clear promise to unite us, to tell us it doesn't matter. If you're a Muslim, a black, a Jew, a woman, the left in its contemporary form, the identitarians, actually split us into identity groups. Yeah. And instead of fighting together, we are fighting each other. It, in fact, it is the left and this new left that prepared the ground for the invasion of globalization, the, 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 the transformation into a, a service economy, the obliteration of manufacturing, and so on and so on. Everything that is disastrous in our current society in, has a lot to do with left, contemporary left, and in, when it comes to Britain, directly with the Labour Party. Now, well, didn't Blair, the, sorry, did, didn't Blair just continue Thatcherite policies? Effectively. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But then, but then, but then, you know, we would, we would have expected, um, we, we, we expected actually Corbyn to come up with uh, ideas that will unite us. And these foolish men, actually did the complete opposite and made and it made the momentum into his uh, um, um, into his allies and momentum is unfortunately a bunch of identitarians now there is something that i probably said in your program this is something that people should understand the most troubling aspect of hitler ideology Hitler's ideology, is racism. What is the meaning of Hitler's racism? Hitler ad adhered to politics that is biologically oriented. He wanted to create politics of Aryan people. This is the most problematic aspect of Nazism. National socialism is not a problem. Socialism of uh, of one people, socialism of Aryan, uh, of uh, sorry, of the German-speaking people is not a problem. Socialism of Aryan people is a problem because if you are born in Germany and you are not an Aryan, you have a problem. If you are a Jew, black, uh, Romani, and so on and so on, the idiotic identitarian left actually fell into the exact. Hitlerian ideology. They define themselves politically by their biology, by gender, by skin color, by the Jewish gene in the mother, and so on and so on. This is a disastrous, and the, what we see today is a huge mass protest of British working class against this duplicitous moronic idea and unfortunately Corbyn is in the center of it. Now, now we get to the, to the crux of it. What are these people going to do? Folks, if you're listening to this, you're not going to hear a chat like this anywhere across UK media today or any other day. These are the issues that should be being discussed on the BBC and Channel 4 I totally news agree with today. You. These are really important issues. What is going to happen when the people, get out, I'm, when I say I'm a working class kid, I'm not um, being in any way dishonest or trying to score points with my listeners. My father was a factory worker at Waterford Crystal in Waterford in Ireland. We, I grew up in a council estate surrounded by people whose fathers and mothers went to factories to work. And I'm going to say it, I'm immensely proud of it because 
we grew up in a place where selfish individualism was unthinkable or unheard of. People did things in the interests of the wider community. People were selfless and most people were able to get by regardless. We, we looked out for, for one another. What I'm going to... So, so, so I'm, this is a preamble. I totally understand, sympathise and feel sorry for, and I don't want to be patronising, the people who have been screwed to the wall by the policies you've talked about, by the Blairite, Thatcherite policies, by Reagan's policies, manufacturing destroyed, cities destroyed, jobs shipped overseas, all these cliches, but it was all true, it all happened. When the people realise that Nigel Farage and his crony capitalism and his free market capitalist ideas and Donald Trump and others like him are in fact, I'm not going to call them liars, at least not Farage anyway, because I, I think Farage believes what it is he says, and I interviewed Farage many times during my days in Spain. But what's going to happen to us as a society? What, what What's going to be the result of when people find out that these guys will not return manufacturing jobs, will not return a sense of national identity, will not bring back the good old days. What's going to happen then? Okay, this is uh, this is obviously uh, a very difficult question, and yeah. uh, I, I make uh, I make a living uh, uh, playing jazz and writing philosophy rather than being a prophet. But I will tell, I will try to to uh, and to elaborate on this issue and to enlighten it. Um, the way I see the success of uh, Farage or Trump. Uh, the electoral success of Trump obviously didn't succeed in anything since yeah, he, yeah. he settled in the um, in the White House. I see these people uh, and their maneuvers as clear symptoms of general fatigue. And uh, I can elaborate with you and to uh, and 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 and. and and to define what is uh, that fatigue, if you want, we can do it in a second. I see it as a as a, a, a symptoms of general fatigue from politics, from economy falling apart, from zero prospect of future. You know, people are committed committing suicide all over around us. You know, my daughter, you know, on the way to work yesterday, she called me, oh, uh, daddy, I'm late to work. Somebody jumped in front of the train. And apparently this happened like three three times in the last weeks. This this wasn't the situation uh, when, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we grew up. Now, the way I see it, we are now on a very, very important junction as humanity, as Brits, as the Europeans, and whatever you want to call it. We have, on the right of us, we have fascism. And when I say fascism, I actually don't see it as a, the most horrible thing. Yeah, I can, I can elaborate about it. And it's, I think that people know exactly what I'm referring to in the British society, and it's extremely popular. We have one option, is fascism. The other option is, and try not to laugh, uh, I, I do accept that some people may find it funny, divinity. And as I see it, left is not an option at all. It is dead in the water. What do I mean with divinity? The idea of divine understanding it is the search for unity, for understanding of our role in this universe. At the end of the day, we didn't choose to be here, <laughs> as yeah. far as I can remember. You know, at a certain yeah. stage in my life, I realized that I'm there. I, I, I was existing. I realized that uh, I'm here. That I realized the meaning of temporality. I'm going to be here 50, 60, not more than 50 already, but, um, but 60, 70, 80, 90 years. And I have to fill this existence with meaning. And this meaning should connect me to others. And when you start to think about those issues, you go back to Jesus Christ 
to love, loving your number, turning your other cheek, you go back to Muhammad. You go back to Islam. You, you can go back to Buddha. You know, you can go back to few elements that, elementary ideas that teach us how to exist, how to give meaning to our, uh, to our life, how to live with others, how to be modest. And this is for me the real true meaning of socialism. As opposed to the ludicrous Marxist idea that reduce us into material object and completely deny our spirituality. By the way, I'm talking about Marxist. I'm not talking about Marx. I make a big uh, yeah, big distinction. And you do in the book, by the way, being in time, uh, yes. post political manifesto. It's I, very... I, I, I don't have ma ma major issues with Marx, but uh, but uh, but uh, um, I have major uh, issues with uh, Marxists, most of them, except Stalinists, maybe. And by the way, yesterday somebody mentioned on Facebook, and I probably I probably saw it a few times, and I forgot that George Orwell said, "I'm not against socialism. I'm against socialists." You know, yeah. So it's pretty much the same idea. Not, not the principle, but those charged with, or, or those who attempt to, um, to also implement it. to yeah. know, to yeah. know how, how to live together and actually destroy the, the prospect of such a thing happening. Well, it was this, I mean, we, we, we could spend hours on this subject. In, in this country, unions, which were fantastically benevolent at one time, organisations for working people, were basically disempowered through three different governments, through the Thatcher, yeah. Blair, and then the Cameron government. And unions now are a pathetic shadow of what they were. They don't do anything now, unions. But the unions were fantastic institutions at one time. That's why I talked about socialism and socialists doing things in the present and not, you know, looking let, to the let, future. Let, yeah, it, it is a very, very important uh, po uh, point, what you're saying here, because... When we look at the history of labor and the history of unions, we understand why the labor movement and working class politics was at a certain stage a very effective and a very functional setting. It is very simple. The hierarchic system of the labor party was fueled by the union. So a guy who did a very good job representing his friends at work uh, in the struggle for a, a pension or whatever it was, or uh, extra hours and being paid properly, would make his way to the union. And in the union, he would, if he was that clever and that effective, he would find his way to the national uh, um, executive, you, um, yeah, yeah. From there to the labor, and then ideally to the to the top of the party, to the decision makers uh, class. The situation now in the last twenty years is because manufacturing is gone. The union are completely dysfunctional. The labor has lost this ability to be. Um, to, to find those gifted people and instead of union uh, activists and union leaders and people who were clever and functional, the labor politicians in the last 30 years are people who were involved in university activism. Now, who are the people who are involved in university activism? People who don't take drugs, don't do sex. Don't. I don't want to be too. You know. And you know. Don't the f word. And don't study. They are the most miserable people um, in the student stu studential universe. These activists are groomed into the party. They become counselors. They are a class of pro professional politicians that have never proved themselves in anything. And if you look even at the career of Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn didn't work. I mean, a proper job. 
no, in his never. life. That's not right. a, not once, not one day in his life. I looked at his biography. I, I remember at the age of twenty two, he became kind of a of an activist. He is not a person who grew up from labor. They call themselves labor, but the meaning of labor is something that is totally foreign to every member of this party. Well, you just described, the people you just described have been labelled SJWs or social justice warriors. They seem to believe that it is their mission, their life's mission. And I mean on a lower level, because at the very highest level, you know, where the elite, where the power really lies, they're laughing at all of this. But the people you're talking about, the activists, the momentum people, they believe that it is their divine, you use the term divinity as where we should be, but they think it's their almost their divine mission to transform or change society, to make it equal for everybody. And they do this by, you know, one of the ways they do it, and you and I have talked about this, is creating more and more vulnerable groups that need to be protected and that need to be promoted and to be advanced. And of course, ironically, the people that suffer the most when this happens are ordinary, semi-skilled or low-skilled people. You know, I've seen this in this country, I've seen it in the US. You know, we talk about the disparity in education. It seems to be kind of white, kind of ethnic UK kids and white white ethnic US uh, kids and children who seem then, as this kind of agenda progresses, they seem not to advance and they seem to kind of stagnate. So I've probably made a complete balls of explaining that, but that's how I see it anyway. No, no, but 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 I think social I think justice this warriors. Is, yeah. this, this is a cr- really crucial issue, as and as you probably remember, I did <laughs> uh, uh, when I wrote the be- being in time, and I was very concerned about it be- be- because I-, I went back to one of the most uh, problematic uh, uh, social scientist, uh, social social science uh, text of the 20th century, a book that uh, was be- practically speaking was burned. I went to the uh, uh, to the bell curve. And actually, I uh, showed what were the problems with the bell curve, but I actually argued that the bell curve gave us, despite the problems that it had uh, with race and so on and so on, gave us the most important, crucial insight uh, that could help us to save ourselves from a class genocide, which is what we are doing now. This is what you were describing. There is a class genocide, and there is a class genocide because people with low ability are now doomed to end up as underclass. Dead, basically, I would say. By the way, the book that Gilad mentioned is a Murray and Herrnstein book published in 1994. I've not read the book, so I'm not going to try and come off all intellectual here. I never read the book, but it's the bell uh, curve. Who or what is responsible? I thought you'd gone all new agey on me there a few minutes ago when you started talking about uh, divinity. But I I wouldn't laugh. You said you might laugh. I wouldn't laugh because I'm very open-minded to it. What is responsible for it? Because what we've described there... I, I could I could see and maybe you know I'm I'm a foreigner so maybe I'm using maybe I'm using the 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 wrong um, expression but what I really mean in divinity is the acceptance that we are limited in our capacity to turn things back a bit from this anthropocentric revolution of the enlightenment. We are born into a world. We have to adapt into language that has been there before us. We have to find our way. We have to feed ourselves from a certain age. And all those things are not easy. And in order to achieve them, we could do uh, learning once again to respect each other, love your neighbor, to respect the soil, 
which is a basic patriotic instinct, to respect rootedness, so we respect our heritage. And all those things are things that are opposed by, you call them uh, social justice warriors, uh, I can call them identitarians, yeah. and uh, some people call them cultural Marxists. But it's also opposed, let, let, me, let me put this in there, it's also opposed by the characters that we've been talking about earlier on, namely the very successful alternative right characters like uh, Nigel and like uh, Trump, whom isn't real anyway, Trump is just a puppet of neocon Zionism, but, but the, the, these people on the right oppose the, the the thinking and the understanding of what we are just as much as the pretend fake socialist social justice warriors people are trapped basically what we're talking about is kind of extricating ourselves away from even the notion of politics you may you may be right you may be right i don't know what nigel farage thinks about thinks about rootedness but i think that the message that he conveyed the message that he delivers and the same, by the way, applies to Trump, that is uh, very much pro-rootedness. By the way, if you look at Farage, uh, uh, contemporary Farage, uh, where the Brexit party, it doesn't touch any of that. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't talk about rootedness. It doesn't talk about immigration. He, is now, beca- he now became the, the hero of uh, democracy. Can All I right, can I interject? So- can I interject briefly there? Because I, I, and I will shut up then. But I, the, the point I want to make is, is the, the reason I say this about Farage, because I'm of course very much as an Irish socialist against every real socialist in the world would be against a political union like the European Union for for so many millions of reasons, and I like the cut of Farage's jib. I've had him on shows in Spain over the years and. I've gotten to know a few people around him over the years and uh, he won't come on programmes like this, of course, these days because of my associations with um, horrible racists like you, Atzman, for one. But anyway, <laughs> but, but anyway, look, what I'm saying is, Farage, yes, the European Union, totally undemocratic, um, destroyed manufacturing in the UK, it certainly helped to do that. The point is, when and if Farage gets his hands on the big seat, if the Brexit party grew into something very big and if he formed or if he was part of a coalition government in the future, what Farage would ultimately do is he would give the country to the European Union by other means. And I say that by he would sign trade agreements encompassing things like TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The point I'm making is he's no friend, Nigel, neither are any of his contemporaries on the right of the working man and of the socialist struggle. No friend. What he will do is take the country away from the European Union. Lovely. But what he'll give it to is mass privatisation of public assets. Vital public assets. The police will disappear. That's the, Look, I know I'm, I'm being very long-winded. That's the point I'm making, right? Obviously, obviously, I don't know much about it because, uh, I, and I, I'm not sure that Farage uh, uh, knows much about it. I suspect one of the most, one of the biggest absurd that we see in British politics. Uh, I kind of, I, I uh, go on a tangent, but I'm going to come back in a second, as you will see, uh, is that um, uh, the Jewish pressure group, the Israeli lobby, the BOD. They invested a lot of money and effort in the occupation of our two major parties. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, uh, two years ago, we saw Theresa May uh, waving uh, a placard saying, uh, Je suis juif. I called her uh, since then, uh, Theresa, Je suis juif, uh, May. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn became Jeremy Grovelstein. He has been groveling shamelessly to every, and apologizing for things that he didn't do, uh, to every Jewish pressure group. And the most astonishing thing 
is that by the time the invasion of the Israeli lobby was complete, these two parties evaporated and the British people moved to other parties, to the Lib Dems and the, obviously Bre uh, Brexit party and some other uh, parties. So this is very, very interesting. The meaning of it, for me, I suspect that it is just a question of hours before we see the formation of uh, Israeli Friends of Nigel. Okay? And uh, by the time this happens, uh, they will secure uh, their interests, and their interests are very clear. And this is something that I don't think that I mentioned on your program, and it is something that has never been mentioned in any British uh, media press uh, coverage. I know it because I read Hebrew and I follow Israeli press on a daily basis, and I published it on my site and made sure that some people in Britain uh, brought, uh, brought uh, this uh, information to the attention of Brits. The Israelis have been talking all along about the fact that if England goes for Brexit, Israel is becoming the gateway for this maneuver. Israel is connected with the United States, connected with the United States. The United States operates now an Israeli colony. Israel is connected very well with Putin and Russia with India. Israel it was destined to become the first trade deal that would open markets for Britain and so on and so on to trade all over the world. Now, for that to happen, we needed, or oh, sorry, the Israelis needed Tories to be in government and to run Brexit, because if Jeremy Corbyn would become the prime minister, all of that would be gone. Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't sign a, 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 a trade agreement with Israel, definitely not the first trade agreement. The entire campaign against Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour was because he could interfere with Israel, Israel's Brexit plans. Yeah, I'm not sure that he would have, but anyway, I know what you're saying. But in their mind, in their in mind, their definitely mind, yeah. they saw him as a potential enemy. Yeah. This may be part of their, uh, what I call pre-TSD, as, as opposed to post-TSD. All right? They are traumatized in advance. Now, um, the issue here is that even Corbyn and the Labour Party were not brave enough to bring this to the attention of the British people. All right, so the Brexit, the Brexit as it plan, it was planned by the Brexit enthusiasts in the Tory Party was actually Brexit for Israel. We are not even splitting from the EU for ourselves. We are splitting from the EU to, to, to make Israel great again. All right? This is a crucial issue. It has never been discussed. No, but, but there's, 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 there's... I have, there's, to, I have to jump... Israel is discussing it constantly. Let me jump in there because there, there is a contradiction there. I've been talking on this program in recent weeks and I've been using quotes from various uh, European Union um, uh, ministers and commissioners and also the the European Union ambassador to Tel Aviv. The relationship between Israel and the European Union is pretty good at the moment and it's going to get better because all manner of deals are, are in the pipeline uh, to do with um, energy and, and that as well. So the Israel is definitely pretty close and plans on being closer to the European Union. Definitely. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I, I totally see it. And by the way, there are also um, Jewish voices and Israeli voices that actually are against, uh, that contradict what I'm saying now. They actually want to see Britain 
uh, in a prominent position within the EU. And why? Because Israel, uh, sorry, Britain is under their control and it's a good representation of Israeli interests in the European Union. So everything that I said about... Yeah, I can't argue with it. But tell me what's going on then, because Donald Trump, of course, has been very vocal in his criticism of the European Union. Farage, I don't think for a second that Nigel Farage would take on the Israeli lobby, not in a million years. So Trump wouldn't do it either. I mean, Trump, there's never been a more obviously controlled US president than uh, Trump. So what's going on then? Is this just classic screwing with people's minds? You know? I, I I think that, uh, and this is why so many British uh, and so many Brits are protesting today, especially, uh, we see a general uh, betrayal of the entire political class. Uh, Trump was elected because he seemed uh, to many people um, as uh, some someone who is uh, completely uh, foreign to the to this uh, political corruption. But as we can see, he he adapted uh, very quickly. I don't know if you remember. At the time of the American presidential election, Trump was repeatedly accused of uh, anti-Semitic dog right. whistling. That's right, that's right, he was, yeah. Trump was accused of anti-Semitic dog whistling yeah. because he made all these videos with uh, Janet Yellen and Goldman Sachs and Soros, and everybody said, the Jewish the Jewish uh, writers in the forward and the Washington Post said, can't you see that what he's doing, he's actually signaling our Jews out. Um, but he wasn't, though. What he was doing was playing to his base. Okay, this, so this is exactly the issue. This from is the, the issue, success, yeah. From the success of Donald Trump, the one thing that we can assume is that there is quite a strong support for this kind of expose of uh, the Jewish and Israeli or whatever influence within America. However, once in power, uh, Trump uh, definitely <laughs> Uh, did very little to stop Goldman Sachs. He did very little to stop uh, Soros. Hang on and, a second uh, now. Hang on a second. You're being a bit. You're, you're you're being a bit. You're playing around with the facts there. He he. Not only did he do very little, he put them in his cabinet, my friend. No, I know. I was I was a bit sarcastic. All okay, right? yeah, he put them in his fucking cabinet. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I was, uh, I was, I was a bit cynical. You are right. No, it's funny. You're funny. You're absolutely right. Look, he, he said, I, "I'm going to drain the swamp," and then he just chucked the same old creatures back All into right. the swamp. Now, right now, um, I was asked about it today, and uh, uh, how how did he manage to? to do all of that and to get away with it. I think that the take home message is quite simple. Trump was elected because he managed to to uh, bank, to capitalize on that vivid fatigue of uh, American working people. Yes. Of the of the devastation that uh, and the impover impoverishment that they were subject to. Once in power, once in power, Trump is not as stupid as we want to believe. Trump made a clear change, and rather than providing any of his uh, uh, promises, he made himself into a symbolic identifier for these people. He pushes his uh, phantasmic uh, victimhood, is subject to, to New York Times, uh, uh, slander, and so on and so on. And uh, unfortunately, it, it seems as if, uh, as if uh, his policy um, Post election, uh, while in while being president, was uh, was uh, successful enough, probably even to make him uh, to get him reelected. So he's a very very interesting character. But this brings us back to 
where we started today. Well, it brings us back to a question that I want to ask, and we're going to wrap this up in about five minutes anyway. But before we do, I want I, I wanted to come back to when it's. I believe that what we've seen is the empire striking back. I'll tell you what I mean by that very briefly, and then I'll put this question to you. I believe that through the Iraq war after September the 11th, there was a period of six, seven, eight years, right up to the manufactured massive crash of 2008. And I think a lot of really good researchers, men and women, were actively engaging people on the internet predominantly at the time. And they were reaching millions of people. And they were showing people that the that change through the ballot box is an illusion. It's a mirage. It doesn't exist. It could never exist. That we have to find a different way. Now you touched on the different way with your notion of divinity, which I agree with. So all of these researchers, and you might have been one of them yourself, were doing extremely well. I, I don't want to use that feckin' term waking people up but at least they were more and more people were unshackling themselves a very important term it's, yeah waking awakening, up awakening awakening is is okay sorry no let it's, me finish this let term. me just finish this quick point all this was going on in the noughties people were realizing it's a sham it's a rigged game it doesn't matter who it is which party which man which woman it is a lie it can never change so the empire has struck back Seeing that people were, up, you, you described it brilliantly when you said fatigue, seeing that people were becoming aware of it and then becoming more self-aware about what they could do about it, the empire has struck back and it has given us this crazy puppet show that we've seen in 2014, 15, the election of Trump in 2016 and now this mass polarisation online where people are joining in People are re-engaging with the system in a way that maybe they'd never done even going back 40, 50, 60 years. And I think that was a direct result of the establishment, the elite, the hidden hand, whatever you want to call them, seeing that there was a massive groundswell of awakening in the noughties, mid-noughties and late noughties. So the question was ultimately, when people realised that Nigel, as an idea, Nigel Farage, you, you know, Nigel might be a good guy, maybe he is, but is never going to change anything. Jeremy Corbyn, as you brilliantly and eloquently explained earlier, never going to change anything. Trump, what will they do then? Will they just accept the next caped crusader from the left or from the right? Or will this be the big sea change when they realise that they were duped again, is my question. Um, obviously, I don't have... Uh, I'm not qualified... Well, neither to, am I. It's just an to opinion. Produce, to produce, to produce an answer, and if I uh, if I produce an answer, it definitely won't be an educated uh, uh, answer. However, however, you use the word awakening. Um, I think that what we see is a global awakening. And the most fascinating thing about this awakening is that despite the fact that we are living in a globalist universe and our main street in London look like the main street, uh, like a high street in Paris and in Prague and in New York, despite that, this awakening is taking a very different shape in each country. So in Paris, we see uh, the, 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 yellow, the yellow vest um, who are uh, turning, uh, turning the Bastille and it looks like a civil war. And they already are using uh, uh, weapons against uh, civilians. And actually in Britain... The police, you mean? Boy, do I know what you mean? You mean the police are using the weapons against the, the yellow vests, yeah. Using weapons yeah. like in Israel, against protesters. Yeah. Like the Israel is using against Palestinians, and it's not very uh, hard to imagine why, because uh, the president is uh, himself an ardent Zionist. In Britain, we can see that this shift of, awake, um, of awakening 
is taking kind of a, I wouldn't say parliamentary, but kind of an electoral uh, uh, shift, uh, which suggests to me that the Brits actually, and you may be surprised and you may think that I'm completely wrong, have a very strong, unique, collective survival instinct. I do, I do disagree, yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah, and you won't be surprised. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. I, I disagree because I think they... they. I, I remember, I keep mentioning this. I remember that amazing scene in the second Matrix film when the architect of the Matrix explains to um, Neo, the character Keanu Reeves, that, look, this has happened time and time and time and time again. You're an anomaly and yet we manage to overcome it and the system endures. And what I see with the British people, I see them being antagonised and more and more and more likely now than ever to assign themselves to one of these identity groups that you brilliantly, and I'm not kissing your arse, it's an excellent read being in time. They can't wait to jump into bed with an identity group and stay in the system and keep themselves plugged in to the matrix and to the notion that just around the corner there is a party or there is a man or a woman that can change things and the answer is they can't okay okay listen as i said i'm not a prophet i only judge by what i see i see a lot of frustration genuine frustration genuine in brits i i think that it i i believe that is it is genuine yeah however i however i just saw it today um um, a very interesting uh, on the kind of the evening standard uh, this evening, you know, I kind of was in the tube and I, uh, the evening standard made, made a very, made a, um, a poll today and it said that some 90% of Brexit party voters say definitely going to vote um, a Brexit party. When it comes to the other parties, 46% of Green voters, 44% of Labour backers, 40% of Liberal Democrats were not sure today what they were going to vote. What I'm trying to say, when it comes to the people who are frustrated, they are genuinely frustrated. They are not going to budge. Whether they are going to be manipulated or not, Obviously, they can be manipulated. I myself was manipulated by by uh, by Jeremy Corbyn. I was the first person to I support know. publicly. And I All told right. you at the time what he was. And, and you know, I've, I've been wrong 500 times more than I've ever been right, but I've seen this so many times. You know, it would be an amazing transformation in people. But, but let me let me let me give you let me give you a, something that will actually confirm your. Uh, <laughs> most tormenting fears and this is uh, because i can see that uh, you, you probably have to uh, to, to move to we'll your wrap next it up, yeah. or whatever um, when i look at all those right-wing ideologists and agitators and politicians from farage to trump to a classic case is obviously tommy robinson who is as i mentioned seems to do quite well in your region um, i don't know about that but anyway uh, 200 people turned up to see him in salford i don't know i don't know you know i'm obviously not there i just kind of saw a um, few a uh, few tweets and uh, so on and so on what we see in very clear terms is that their core inspiration the core inspiration the model of sovereignty that they are aspired to it's awful what i'm about to say is actually israel israel is a country that surrounded itself with walls it treats immigrants and refugees appallingly and this is exactly what Donald Trump wants. He wants to surround his country with walls. For him, Israel is the model which he tries to copy. And this definitely makes Benjamin Netanyahu um, pretty much the, the puppeteer of uh, American politics. 
Now, when, why I mentioned Tommy Robinson? Because Tommy Robinson in the Open is a Zionist. Somebody showed me a, a yeah. tweet. A tweet where he calls himself a Jew. Yeah, it's hilarious. I, yeah, I think I don't think that he's religiously Jew or ethnically Jewish, but he seems he seems he see the Jews as the uh, the 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 light of the nation. Well, it's my my enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay, kind of okay, a thing, right? Okay. So we we accept we accept yeah. that the right is inspired by this uh, the contemporary right definitely alt right is inspired by this uh, israeli uh, uh, nationalist uh, model what is way more disturbing is when we go to the social justice heroes they are actually inspired by this jewish school of tikkun olam and pro immigration and they are large largely funded by uh, philanthropes like uh, George Soros and his uh, open society institute and what it really means and this confirms your fear is that at the end of the day our right and our left are manipulated and driven and are inspired by one ideology that is that has something to do with Jerusalem, with Zion, with Israel, with Jewishness. And this is pretty frightening. It means that at the end of the day, wherever we go, we are swimming in a chicken soup. Yeah, ultimately. I mean, ultimately. I couldn't have put it like that, but you're absolutely right. You know, a real revolution today would be millions of registered voters in the UK not only refusing to go to the ballot box because it's an outrage it's an outrage against decency that you vote to leave a fascist dictatorship in 2016 and three years later you're asked to return MEPs to Brussels you wouldn't use the F word earlier on but it's fuckery beyond all belief and yet they go to the ballot box today to put in anti-European Union parties into the European Union. It's hilarious. It's vaudeville. It is Monty Python-esque. It's so ridiculous. A real revolution would be for a couple of million people to go to Downing Street or to the Houses of Parliament and say, enough is e fucking enough. Your time is up now. This paradigm, this notion of parliamentary democracy where we put you into power and the first thing you do is swear allegiance to a queen and to her heirs. Not to the people, not to the people who voted for you, but you can't enter Parliament. You can't even make a speech without swearing allegiance to a fucking lizard, as David Icke might say. Right? I, I wouldn't say that. David would. Maybe I vicariously use David to say things like that. Maybe I've just done that. But that's what they do. That would be a real revolution. But people are terrified of that, Gilad, because when you mention that to people, they think, "Well, we'll have total anarchy then, and the strong will survive." And if we do take over the pillars of the establishment and say enough's enough you've got to leave non-violently non-violently ultimately the thugs like Tommy Robinson and his ilk they'll ultimately take over but it doesn't have to be like that you know it doesn't have to be I'm going to give you the final word on it I, I dream of I dream of people marching in their millions to say look it's over it's over now you and your Jewish your, your Zionist lobbies and your Jewish lobbies and you over there and your free market capitalism giving every square inch of the planet to private interest groups, you're all gone. It's all over. We're taking it back. Yeah. I, 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 um, we, we, we ended up uh, touching the, the, the J thing. And I think that uh, people are awakening and uh, it is a very powerful uh, thing for me to witness because I, I've, I've thought for many years that uh, the Brits are pretty apathetic to politics. They just don't touch this subject. They don't like to talk about it. And suddenly out of the blue, um, Nigel Farage has managed 
to mobilize them to think about themselves. So I actually think that this is a very good thing, whether uh, uh, you support Farage or you don't support Farage. I myself actually uh, don't necessarily... <laughs> You're like me, Gillard. Look, I'm agnostic about Nigel as well. The point I'm making is Mayor Amshel Rothschild did say, it's not a conspiracy theory, a theory even, I couldn't give a damn who you elect. Couldn't give an arse, because ultimately you've got to come and get your money from me. And that's where we are, and people have to see through that. This is this is this is exact. This is exactly the thing. So I think that British are awakening. Uh, I'm not sure that they can see this process to the end. By the way, we also cannot see it. I'm not sure that they manage to identify the dangerous element that are uh, puppeteering all of that in the background. But I think that the fact that you and me are talking about it already now is uh, suggests, I believe, that within one year, two years, four years, five years, everybody will talk about it. This is something that I've learned. When I started to talk about uh, Jewish identity politics, and I was the first one to 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 uh, refer to this term, or identitarianism, or identity politics, and I was one of the very first to deal with these uh, with these terms and uh, to analyze them philosophically. Probably, I'm still the only one. I, uh, that is doing it kind of in an academic uh, manner. I was subject to a lot of harassment, a lot of abuse. And I can see that out of the blue, suddenly 30% of the Brits totally agree with me. Yeah. All right? Yeah, so you, you did, our yeah. Job, our job as intellectuals, as artists, as thinkers, as philosophers, as spiritual people, as poets, is to help people to introspect, to look at their condition, to look for solutions. And this is what we are doing. We are not politicians. We are not calling people to follow us or to vote for us. I'll tell you something. Maybe this is the best way to finish this interview. I I have so much fun talking to you, always. Yeah, likewise, mate. You know that. I'm a musician and I'm, I'm an educator. And when people come to me to study music, I promise them that I can teach them music, everything I know, in just three minutes. What I show them is how to identify their difficulties, what they're weak at. Number two, how to develop a system to deal with their own difficulties, not my difficulties, their difficulties. And number three, to work on it routinely. And why do I do it? Because to teach for real is to teach other people how to learn on their own. This is what we have to teach people. This is our role as intellectuals, as thinkers, as uh, radio hosts, as people who, who, who talk to, to others. We have to teach, not to tell people what is right and who is wrong. This is what the Marxists are doing. This is what the leftists are doing. This is what the social justice heroes are doing. Our job is to make sure that people think on their own and even come to conclusions that contradict everything we are saying. Until thinking becomes outlawed, of course, but maybe we, we, we won't get as far as that. But that's another... A chat for another day. By the, way, by the way, thinking, thinking is outlawed in Britain for for more than a while, and what we see today is a reaction against this totalitarian, authoritarian, disgusting, disgusting policies that are actually sustained by low level labor politicians in councils. Which we, which we talked about earlier on, and I know there will have been listeners come in on the end of the programme. Um, you've got to grab this when it's on 
Podomatic, iTunes and Spotify very soon, in about 20 minutes in fact. And it'll be on YouTube a bit later on uh, as well because um, it, it, we covered a lot there. Uh, and yeah. and uh, I would urge people to listen to it. You know, don't jump in with two feet when you hear criticism of Jeremy Corbyn or when you hear criticism of Nigel Farage. Just have a listen to it. This is the sort of thing, as I said earlier on, that sadly is not being discussed on television and radio today in the UK. But you reckon that it's a watershed moment, Gillard, that in a few years' time maybe people will have evolved to where they can openly discuss this stuff without screaming racist, without screaming, uh, you know, calling people names, without feeling victimhood, without, without, you know, identifying as a victim because your particular identity group is coming in for criticism. I, I want to mention again, being in time, a post-political manifesto, it's only a couple of hundred pages long. It is a terrific read, it really is. It should be on the shelves of every library and every university in this country. I agree. I like to think it might be on one or two. I'd like to think it might be on one or two. It, um, it definitely is, I can tell you that. Yeah, it is translated um, into uh, many languages. A lot of people read it. Wh- where are you playing next, my friend? Give a plug to the old uh, saxophone I'm playing, there. I'm playing uh, tomorrow uh, in Brighton at the Verdict. And uh, on Sunday, I'm playing uh, at Ascot near Windsor. Lovely. Hopefully the Queen will come to, to uh, <laughs> swing with me. And... Uh, then I'm uh, off uh, during uh, abroad. Um, I'm I'm going to do some uh, concerts uh, in the um, in the Middle East. Fantastic. Well, of course, people can go to gillard.co.uk for details of Gillard's movements, and the book can be found on Amazon. You can get a link to it through Gillard's website as well. Brilliant conversation. It's flown by. I can't believe it's. Approaching seven o'clock, it's absolutely flown by. Thanks for your time, mate. I do appreciate your time. I'm always, always happy to talk to you. You know, it's it's very enlightening for me. I learn a lot. Ah, well, likewise, mate. I learn more. Thanks for coming on and come back real soon. Good luck on the tour, or should I say, break a leg, and good luck in the Middle yeah. East as well. Bye yeah, for man, now, Gilad. Uh, bye for now. Brilliant stuff from Gilad Atzman on uh, your Richie Allen show. I was going to go straight into a tune there, but I, I won't. Um, I'll read a few comments. A few comments have come in. Uh, hi to Martin in Spain who's been tweeting me memes there. How are you doing, Martin? Hi to David. Faisal came in late on that and said, Richie, you can't blame the Brits for trying everything they can within the system, even if it's just voting to expose the illusion of democracy because they know the only alternative will be civil war. I think it's changing, though. The Brexit vote exposed how many people know something's wrong even if they don't know what. Yeah, I can't argue with any of that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there, there was bound to be a reaction when it became apparent that the vote of June 2016 was going to be betrayed. There was bound to be a reaction. We could see that coming. I think all of us could see that people were going to be absolutely irate about it. Because for many people or for the majority of people, they haven't been exposed to the sorts of researchers we've been exposed to, and they haven't listened to or read the writings of people that we've read. You know, people who've been talking about this and predicting this over the years, this Orwellian dystopian paradigm that we inhabit. And for most people, they have no idea. So when they see the vote being betrayed and a Remainer Parliament, because it is Remainer, almost exclusively, apart from a few Brexiteers and the backbenches of the Labour Party. The UK Parliament is filled with people who don't want to leave the European Union and have thwarted at every opportunity the vote of 2016, where 52% of the people, 17.4 million people, said, we want out of the European Union. When they voted in 2016, they didn't vote for a deal with the European Union. They didn't give a mandate to the government to go and do a deal with the European Union. They voted to fucking leave, to leave, to go, immediately. And then they heard about Article 50. Most of them never heard anything about Article 50 or didn't know anything about it until then. Oh, so we're going to stay in for two more years, are we? While we negotiate our way out of it. Fuck. All right, then. Well, I suppose we have to put up with that. Go and get a deal. And then two years passes by and we get to March 
the 29th, 2019. And then they're told, well, we can't reach a deal. The Prime Minister can't get a deal through Parliament. We're going to have to delay it and we're going to have to postpone leaving until the 31st of October. So, of course, people are utterly mad and irate and sick and aware now, I suppose, maybe aware in ways they never were aware, that they don't live in a democracy. They never have done. So I understand what Faisal is saying in his tweet there. But the problem is, things are set up for people by the very establishment that have hoodwinked them and swindled them out of Brexit. That very establishment is giving them the direction to take, to vent their anger, to vent their dismay, their sorrow. The establishment is giving them other political parties and is giving them racist fascists like Tommy the Tit Robinson, the poison dwarf. Do you see the guy? Five foot two, four stone soaking wet. The establishment is doing that. Here you go, there's the answer. And it's no good if people keep going down that road. Shit, they, they, they hoodwinked us again. They got me again. Who am I going to join now? Him over there. No. You see, until we get away from that, nothing will ever change. And it's actually a worse outlook than nothing will ever change. Things will get progressively, steadily worse. And that's been my central theme. That's been running through my monologues for years now. It has to stop eventually, this notion that you can liberate yourself your family and your community by throwing in with a political party or a saviour figure. And the same applies to your dependence and your reliance on what I call the truth or industrial complex. That's just another version of Tommy Robinson and Donald Trump and Brexiteers. It's a crutch. I'll, I'll, I'll go to my truther. I'll go to a truther conference and I'll sit there. It leads to stagnation and inertia and nothing ever changes. You know, that's how I feel about it. And I know I've said that before, but I'm taking the opportunity to say it again. I want to thank Gilad Asman for coming on the programme. Uh, thanks uh, to you for listening. Great to be back. Uh, it really is this week. Great to be back on the show. Loving it and looking forward to Sunday View with you this coming Sunday morning at 11am when we'll go through the Sunday papers and we'll have an eavesdrop on the Sunday morning political talk shows as well. Back to normal. Still doing one or two tinkering bits in the studio. Paul Ripley will be back out with me next week to do a few things. Uh, there are one or two minor sound issues which are not really apparent in the mix and are not apparent in the recording but they are apparent to me and I'm a bit obsessive compulsive like that so we'll do one or two uh, tweaks and um, by next week of course back to two hour shows I know it was a two hour show tonight and I will have two guests pretty much most evenings as well as an interesting news roundup. if you can support the Richie Allen show please do go to richieallen.co.uk there is a PayPal account there is a bank account it's got nothing to do with this move by the way which is making life economically uh, much more less stressful believe you me but the programme depends on you and you entirely. It can't survive without your regular support. So if you've never supported before, do support it. I'll be eternally grateful. Marvellous. You have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go and give a birthday kiss to the future Mrs. Allen, who uh, turned 41 years old today. Look after yourselves and one another. And I'll talk to you on Sunday. All right, until then, bye for now. Thanks for listening.